follow on the screen. John 4, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the will and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. For things that could not satisfy. And then Let's start with prayer. 
Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the stories that we have to learn by. Father, help us to hear the words that you would have us to hear. Your word is living, Father, so I pray that you bring it alive today to our hearts and our souls through the power of your spirit. Lord, help us to be obedient to the words that you would have us to hear also, Father, so that we may apply them so we can bring glory and honor to you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to share, to, see, to raise up your name in praise and honor for you are God alone. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple weeks ago, I talked about John 3.16. And then I said, you can't talk about John 3.16 unless you talk about John chapter 3. When I was studying John 3.16, the reason that I started going on this series, as you might call it or whatever, or repetition as my wife calls it sometimes, um, the research that I did through electronic media, through the internet and everything, came up with John 3.16 and there was so much controversy over one verse that it just saddened my heart. And I just continued to do research. And there was so much truth there, but yet there was so much deception. Because there are people all over claiming one thing and claiming another thing and then all claiming them on God's Word. And so I want to be clear today. John 3.16 does sum up the Gospel in one word. But it all depends on how you look at it. If you look at it from the point that for God so loved the world. It's all about God, His story, His love. And then it ends with heaven. But if you focus on it in me instead, then you twist Scripture. And that's what the devil loves to do. He said in the garden to Eve, he said, is that really what God said? When he came into the wilderness to tempt Jesus, he quoted Scripture, but he was misusing that Scripture. What I found on the internet is so many people relied on John 3.16 to not do anything else. Because they said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes... So I can stop there. It's about me. I don't have to change my life. If I simply believe, God's Word says it and that's good enough. And that just really, really troubles me where you take one verse and you rely on it in that way. So that's why we look back at the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3. And today we're going to go on a little further and look at the story of the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, and you'll see some amazing similarities. And it's not just coincidence that John puts them in order the way that he does. It's not just coincidence that Jesus tells the stories the way he does. You've got to study God's Word to rightly divide the truth. You can't just rely on one verse and say that, oh, my salvation comes in that. Yes, it does. It comes strictly from God because He loves you so much. But if you love Him, you will respond. Jesus, though, didn't need to see our fruits. He didn't need to see our labor. Because guess what? He knows your heart. He knows if you're genuine or not. Whether your labor is there or whether it's not there. Whether your labor is pure or it's not pure, if it's out of a false motive. So don't think He can fool Jesus. He knows. So... God loved us. That's what it's all about. God continues to love us. He always will love us. He created us for that reason. He sought after and bought us back with an incredible price for that reason. And just at the right time, He sent a Savior, who was Jesus Christ, to the world. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are His child, God has made you also an heir. Romans 5, 6-8 through 8 says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 reads, As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For He says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of my salvation I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And that's what that day was in John 4 when Jesus came to the Samaritan woman. It wasn't by chance that He came. 
It was because Jesus was on a mission from God. God sent His only Son so that we might could be redeemed, redeemed and saved. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves me. If I could get one point across, it would be John 3.16, but it would be from the point of how much God loved you. Because if you could just get a glimpse of that, it would change your life. You would not think about your own desires anymore, but you would think about God's desires. You wouldn't think about your own needs above others, but you would think about their needs. Jesus said it when He summed it up. He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then He went in and said, the second is to love your neighbor like yourself. If you truly realize God's love for you, you wouldn't stop at simply believing. Your life would be changed. It would be evident and it would change others' lives as a result. And we are called on a mission too. If you study more Bible verses, you'll see that we are to carry on God's work, that we are a holy priesthood. We have a duty and a responsibility. Jesus knew what His duty was. He knew the mission that He was sent on. Do we understand what our mission is though? True belief, Jesus knows. He knows the individual's heart. He knew why Nicodemus came. Nicodemus didn't even get a chance to tell him because Jesus started telling him why he was there. And he was there because he wanted to find an answer that he thought was correct, that he thought because of what he did and who he was that he would go to heaven. And Jesus let him know three times that you must be born again. Three times he told him truly, truly, or very truly, or listen here, I've got something important to tell you, that you have to be born again in the Spirit. There has to be a heart change. You have to die to yourself if you're going to be born again. Many people think they believe, and what a travesty that is. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me, not some, but many, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons? and in your name perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And part of our mission is to let the gospel message of Jesus Christ to be known, to be a light to the world, so that hopefully we can be the ones that tell people and can change this from ha happening. What a travesty. It's nothing that we do, but if we can be the light to the world, then hopefully they can see what they're doing, and they can turn to God and truly believe. The encounter with the Samaritan woman is so different, but yet it's so similar. And it's amazing that it follows right after the encounter with Nicodemus. Also, this story is not found in any of the other Gospels either. It's only found in John's. And John is trying to let us know who exactly Jesus is because John is so excited because salvation has come into the world instead of condemnation. The Savior, the Messiah that has been promised for so long is here now and He wants everyone to know that joy. But you get totally different storylines here, but yet you get totally the same. And Jesus knows the spiritual need. He knows that each one of the people that, that are involved in the stories, whether they came to Him or didn't come to Him, are lost. One thinks that He is not lost, and the other has no idea that she's lost or even cares. But Jesus knows the spiritual condition of the heart, and that's why He's there for this woman. So let's start looking at John chapter 4. Verses 1 through 4. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that He was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but His disciples. So He left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now He had to go through Samaria. Now, if you just read Scripture and you don't study Scripture, you just assume that Jesus had to go to Samaria because if you look on a map, you have Judea, you have Samaria, and then you have Galilee. But if you understand and study Scriptures, you didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, if you were a Judean, you did not go through Samaria. You did not go through Samaria because they were the scum of the earth. At least they were to the Jews, the devout Jews. They went around Yes, it was much further, it was harder, but they went around so that they didn't have to be involved with these people because these people were lost sinners. That's how bad that the practicing Jews had become. 
They didn't know God's love. That's why John is trying to explain because of that love. They didn't love their neighbor or their friend. They condemned them. So Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria as we think of the word. He had to go through Samaria because it was his mission. It was his duty. He had to bring the gospel message to this woman. That's why he had to go. So he set out. He knew the Pharisee's heart. He knew this woman's heart. And we'll see where the story goes with this woman. Verse 3 says he left for Judea and went back once more for Galilee. Galilee was where he came from. And if you remember from Scripture at all, it says nothing good comes from Galilee. So we've already got the Jews didn't believe or want to impart their faith to the Galileans, but even more that they didn't want to impart that faith to the Samarians. So they avoided that area altogether. It was a no-no. So, But Jesus came, he went that way, because he came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission, just like we have a mission. It doesn't matter to God who you are. It didn't matter to him who Nicodemus was. It didn't matter to him who this woman was. He loved all people just the same. And he sees their need, and that's why he was there. John 4, 5 through 6, it says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, depending on where he was, where he started out from, we don't know exactly, that was probably about a 20-mile journey, up and down hills. It wasn't an easy hike. So if he got up at 6 o'clock, he's taking a pace that's 3 or 4 miles an hour. I don't know about you, but when I get on my treadmill, anything past 3 miles an hour is strenuous. So he hoofed it there, in other words, to get there by the time that woman would come to the well because he knew when she would be to the well. And why was she there at noon? That's kind of strange. Most people wouldn't go to the well in the heat of the day. But she was there at the heat of the day, I think, that she was there because she didn't want the scorn from the other women. Because if we read further in the passage, we'll see that she was not necessarily one that was looked highly upon. So here she is in a pagan land, and she's the pagan of the pagans. And she goes to the well at noon so that she can, involve the, so she can avoid the criticism of the other women. Because most women would want to go at that time because they'd want to go to chat and everything. It's their social club hour. But she wanted to avoid that for whatever reason. Scripture doesn't say, but it's my thought because she knew that she was a sinner. In quite contrast to Nicodemus who thought he was saved. Jesus was on a mission and he knew the woman would be there at noon. He knew that the woman needed living water as we read on. That she needed to know about salvation. And that's why he was here. Because God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to this earth. So if we read on in John 4, 7, it says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? He starts the conversation this time. And he asks, Will you? Will you accept him? Will you believe? Will you offer service? That's what he's asking this woman. Will you give me a drink of water? Nicodemus didn't want to offer Jesus anything. He wanted Jesus to explain to him that he had come, that he was the Messiah. He believed because of the miracles that he saw. But he wanted Jesus to say that he was here to reign and that Nicodemus would be saved. Of course, logically, that's what he thought. But this woman thought she was of no worth to God whatsoever. She lived in her sin. She didn't think anything about it. And that's why Jesus came. He came to the sinners. He came to the sick. He came to the ones that needed Him. And He asked her, Will you give me a drink? Do you think that she realized who He was? If you read the story, I don't think she had a clue who He was at all. And that's usually how Jesus comes to us. He comes to us when we don't realize, when we're not looking for Him. Because then we know that we need a Savior if He gets that through. I don't think that Nicodemus at this point ever realized that his need for a Savior. But we just read earlier that God knew it was exactly 
the right time. Jesus didn't die by coincidence. Judas didn't betray him by coincidence. He didn't leave the region because of coincidence. He left the region because the Pharisees were starting to realize his popularity. And he was becoming more popular than John the Baptist. And they already wanted to kill John the Baptist, so they wanted to kill Jesus. But the time had not yet come. Jesus was on a mission. He had to go to this woman. He had to go to this pe these people. He couldn't be crucified yet because he had not completed his mission. Jesus speaks to the woman against the tradition of the day. Not only did he hurry to get there, but he should have never spoke to this woman, not by tradition. He shouldn't have even been in the land. Let alone, here's a rabbi, here's a teacher, who is speaking to a pagan woman. The disciples, when we read on further, and you'll have to get that next week because we're going to read the, next, the rest of the story next week, whether it's repetition or series or whatever you want to call it. But he shouldn't have even been there talking to the woman. He had sent his disciples on, and he was talking to this pagan woman. So she was amazed that he was talking to her. And it's something that was totally out of tradition that he should have done. A devout rabbi would not even talk to his wife or his daughter in public. That's how serious they were. So Jesus coming out and speaking to this woman flabbergasted her, especially by whatever reason that she knew that he was a Jew. His clothing, the spirit, whoever knows what reason it was. But it just flabbergasted her that Jesus would have the audacity to talk to her. But Jesus doesn't care how hard the journey is. You're worth it. He doesn't care about what other people think. You're worth it. He cares about you being reconciled with your heavenly Father. That's why he came. And he asked for a response from her. He says, will you? True believing requires a response. If we read on in John 4, 8, in parentheses in my Bible, it says, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. He sent them away. Maybe it was for the food. Maybe it was so he could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm not sure what the reason. But if you drop down in John 4, 27, we didn't read that this morning. We'll have to do that next week. So this is when the disciples returned. It says, Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Because he shouldn't have been doing that. But no one asked, What do you want? Or why you are talking with her? Maybe there was a lesson there for the disciples to learn also, right? Most likely, the path leading to this well, everyone went on. Because it was a path. It was the easiest way of resistance to get there. So knowing that, doesn't it make logical sense that the disciples passed her right along the way? And they saw no need whatsoever for this woman's salvation. They had not seen the real reason that Jesus Christ had come. Because if they did, they would have spoke out witnessing to, him, to her. So many times I hear Christians say, I just don't have the opportunity with life. What are you supposed to do? Just at the grocery store, you're just supposed to go up and ask people, do you know Jesus? There are plenty of opportunities. This started with a simple conversation of, will you give me water? But the disciples didn't get it. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it when they came back. And Jesus had been teaching them, spending time with them, saying, this is why I'm here. I'm here to tell others, tell everyone, regardless of their condition, regardless of their background, that God loves them. And that God loves them enough to send me to take their sins and punishment away. The time has come. Wow, how much God loves you and how much He loves me. The woman knew she was worthless. She didn't think that a Savior even applied to her. And we'll see that in her response. In John 4, 9, it says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And in parentheses, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She had been told her whole life that she was worthless. And she was worthless to her people because of the lifestyle she lived and actions that she lived. But Jesus came to the least of these to let it be known that salvation was offered to everyone, regardless of who they were. That's why Jesus was there. Nicodemus thought he would be saved because of who he was and because of what he practiced, how he lives. But Jesus knew his heart. We don't see a decision in the story of Nicodemus. You have to assume that he went away and did not accept everything that Jesus had to say. If 
you read on further here, but you'll have to wait till you go home or we'll have to wait till next week, you'll see that a decision came. You'll see revival came because of one person. Because Jesus Christ came to one person. He went out of His way. He hoofed it for 20 miles at as good a pace as He could physically take His body. And when He got there, Scripture said He was wearied. He was tired. He was beaten. Because it took everything that His 100% human body had to get to this woman at the time she'd be at the well. She wouldn't be there long. She would draw the water and go back. Jesus had that opportunity, that window of opportunity to be there. And He took all of the physical exertion that He had to get there in time. And the story doesn't say, and I think it's remarkable from that, He doesn't even take time to quench His thirst. He doesn't look after His own physical needs. doesn't say He got that drink of water. He was more concerned about this woman's spiritual need. If we read on in John 4.10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is that asks you for a drink? You would have asked him, and he would give, have given you living water. Jesus understands what we need, even when you think he doesn't. Even when you think you, your problems are too much, that you think you need that pill to take care of it, or you think that God just simply doesn't care anymore because of all the things that you've done. He's there every step of the way. And He cares about you enough that He would give His life for you. That's the worth that you have. And that's what I find so incredible about this story. This woman was the least of these compared to Nicodemus who was the greatest of these. And Jesus did all that He could do to tell her what would save her soul. Reading on in verses 11 and 12, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? So she begins to question. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it, as did his sons and his livestock? Just like Nicodemus, though, she does not understand what Jesus is talking about. She, Nicodemus thought Jesus was talking about being physically born again. He said, how can one enter his mother's womb? And this woman had no idea that Jesus was talking about salvation. She still thought he was talking about getting water to drink. She was amazed and perplexed that he was talking to her, and this was great. Here it was, someone paying her attention for the first time in her life. But she still didn't understand what Jesus was truly talking about. And so many times during our lives, we do focus on our physical needs. We focus on what we need to do, our job, our relationships, when we don't focus on our spiritual relationship with God. I heard something on the radio the other day, and the kid asked his mom, were they having uh, fast food for dinner tonight? And then he applied that to Scripture later. And he said, is this going to be fast food Scripture, something we're going in and out for to go? Or are we going to spend time in God's Word, sit down at a meal with it? And it really pricked my heart because so many times that's what we do. We take time out for Jesus instead of Jesus being the whole center of our time, being our purpose. Because when we are born again, we die to all that sin nature. We've started a life afresh if we just realize it and embrace the Spirit. God's focus, His desires, His needs, His wants should be our primary focus and we should love to give back. It shouldn't stop at simply believing, but that's where our life as a Christian should truly begin. Reading on in verse 13 and 14, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but, complete opposite, Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So not only will you get eternal water that will eternally quench you, but the Spirit living inside of you will bubble up like a fountain. Not a fountain, like a raging river. That's the kind of power the Spirit can have in your life if, you, if you'll let Him. And Jesus told Nicodemus that if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again from above, born again by the Spirit. God loves you enough that He gives you His Spirit to reside in you so that you can have the power to conquer whatever you need to conquer. Not so you can live a life for you, but so you can live a life that will bring Him glory and honor. The word believed comes from the word pisteo. Now, Nicodemus believed, Scripture says he did. 
But it doesn't say that he believed to the capacity that he knew what born again meant. So there is a difference in simply believing. And Jesus says that he looks at each other's hearts. So Jesus knows you cannot fool him. You cannot fool God. He knows if your heart is genuine or not. All throughout Scripture, it tells you that God looks at the heart. That's what He desires. He looks for wholehearted service. So let's compare the stories a little bit. Nicodemus came knowing, even believing, looking for answers, but he was unwilling to hear them. The Samaritan woman didn't come at all. Jesus came to her. She came with no knowledge, not looking for anything. Nicodemus spoke first because he thought he was somebody. The Samaritan woman had to be spoken to because she thought she was nobody. Jesus replied to Nicodemus and said, Truly, truly, listen up, because I know whether you pisteo, whether you believe or not. Jesus spoke first to the Samaritan woman and asked if she would respond to his request, if she wanted to know how, if she would be willing to drink. But both were amazed and responded and asked how. They didn't understand. Jesus answered Nicodemus by reinforcing that he needed to listen up and be born again. Said it to him again. Jesus answered the woman with, If you knew, you would, and do you won't. He asked her a question because he knew her heart. Her heart was willing to listen to him, where Nicodemus' wasn't ready yet. Both were still confused, though, and asked how again. Jesus told Nicodemus again, and even sarcastically, he told him, You should know already, you're a teacher of the law, but you're unwilling to listen. Your pisteo is not good enough. Jesus told the woman again how to be born again by drinking living water that he offered. She answered with sarcasm because she still didn't understand. So she used sarcasm to Jesus rather than Jesus using sarcasm. But it didn't stop him. He didn't care if she, if she insulted him or didn't know who he was. He had a mission and he loved her. She just simply didn't understand. If, if this is not proof enough, what about when Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was concerned about our salvation. That's why he came. The Bible does not say, but we can assume that Nicodemus goes away, that his belief, his pisteo, is not genuine. The woman, on the other hand, tells Jesus to give her the living water, even though she still doesn't understand, so that she will be, never be thirsty again. And that's where our story here ends today in verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She was willing. She was willing to hear out Jesus. And Jesus was there for her salvation. In the conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, John the author, not John the Baptist, uses the word five times, the word pisteo for belief. But he also stresses born again. He also stresses truly, truly listen up. John's gospel was written so that we would believe. In John 2 verses 23 through 24 it says, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many saw signs that he had performed and believed in his name. Now does that mean they truly believed? You can't take this one verse. The following verse says it right afterwards. But Jesus would not entrust Himself for them, for He knew all people. He knows their heart. He knows whether their belief is true or not. The word believe is used 264 times in the New Testament. A quarter of them, 86 times, are used in the book of John. Because John wanted to get across the point that because God loved you so much, simply believing is enough. But once you've believed, simply believing is just the beginning. It's not nearly enough. Your life will be changed because you will be born again. John speaks so much about believing, sometimes we focus on that and we don't focus on the rest of the gospel. But John even tells us in his own book in John 20, verses 30 through 31, his purpose for writing. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe. You've got to study God's Word. You've got to seek Him out. If you seek Him out, 
He will show you. He will reveal Himself. He asked the woman first if she was willing. Then He explains to him who He really is. And salvation does come in the story. The rest of this verse says that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. But we don't need to preach just John 3.16. We need to preach a life that shows Jesus Christ. We need to preach and make disciples thereof, teaching them so that they can make disciples thereof. We need to live a life that is born again. And next week we'll talk about the rest of this story and we'll talk about a couple more things that John says that you must do. Jesus had a mission and He labored intensely towards that mission, towards accomplishing it, that He wouldn't leave anyone out, even a wretched woman like the Samaritan woman. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we have a mission also to carry on His work, to spread that gospel message so that none, just like John was passionate about writing his gospel, that none will perish, but that everyone may have everlasting life. It's our mission. It's our duty. We read about it in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples... And for so long I read that verse and stopped there. Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you've got to also teach them to obey everything. There's two things to do there. I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's why He gives us His Spirit to empower us. The Spirit is proof that we have life eternal. That's why Jesus tells Nicodemus that you must be born again. The Spirit is what seals salvation to us. It proclaims to God the Father that we belong to Him and no one can take that away. That we are a child of God, born again for a new purpose. How will people be saved unless they hear? And how will they hear unless we tell them? The story doesn't stop with simply saying if you believe. The story starts there. We go and tell and then we make disciples thereof. We need to obey all of God's Word. We need to live an example. So we certainly don't need to be the ones that pick and choose what we're going to follow out of God's Word. But we need to be the light, just like Jesus Christ was the light. That we take what we hear, that we apply it, and that we study all of God's Word so that we can apply it to our lives. Because there's a mission field out there that the time will come when Jesus will bring in His harvest. And we will be responsible for the things that He has given us, the responsibilities He's given us here on earth. I don't want to be like the disciples and totally miss seeing the woman on the road because she was a woman that Jesus went out of His way to go find and go tell her about salvation when they didn't even see the opportunity. So I pray that together we will uplift each other, that we will realize our mission, and that we will go and tell the world and teach them the gospel message. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Thank You for the examples that You have given us. Thank You that Your Scripture holds up to the test of time. Father, that You did did love us, that You do love us so much that You would give Your Son to die in our place. I can't comprehend it, but I can believe it. And as a result of belief, Father, I want to give my life back to You. And Father, I pray there will be nothing that stands in the way of Your children serving You being respectful for loving you the way that they should, showing back their love because you love first. It's nothing that we did, not by works of righteousness, but Father, I lay down my life before you in gratitude because you love me so much. And Father, there are souls that are hanging in the balance. Help us to realize the responsibility and the privilege that we have set before us, that we will bring glory and honor to you and hopefully light the way that others will find their way home to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.